Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Michel Barbeau. I'm a professor of computer science at Carleton University. And I'm also a licensed uh, I'm radio operator. My call sign is VE3EMB. We had a, a nice uh, presentation about uh, the combination of new radio and, and uh, amateur radio yesterday by VE7ZD. Uh, and uh, I would, for me, uh, amateur radio is very important for my work because I find a lot of inspiration in it. And uh, if you have, uh, if you're doing digital communication uh, in, uh, with, on amateur radio frequencies, uh, you will recognize a few things in my talk. So uh, to answer the question of the uh, last speaker for me, the next thing is underwater communications. Uh, I would say it's a relatively new area. And uh, we know how to do it, but there are still many unknowns. And one of the things I'm doing uh, with the help of, co of collaborators and, stu and students, we are trying to do long range. So uh, one of the motivations for our work is um, the need to uh, monitor the activities in the north of uh, Canada. And so it's, a, it's an area relevant to US also. Uh, because of global warming, ice is melting, and it's a, it's a very wide area, so channels for uh, maritime traffic, traffic are openings. And uh, there will be a need to monitor the area. Uh, it's very wide, so it doesn't make sense to uh, <clears throat> post people there. So uh, one of the goals is to build a surveillance network. And uh, so that, uh, part of, the, uh, of that includes uh, underwater communications between nodes of the network. So my talk is about that. Uh, about, uh, so um, we're trying to achieve long-range communications on the water. It's not easy. Uh, we have done quite well so far. And uh, I'll uh, show you what we have done and, and uh, what are the challenges that, that remain. So this, uh, in this talk, I will highlight uh, the work of a graduate student working with us. Uh, his name is Jamil Kassem. So this is the outline of my talk. So I'll talk uh, again a little bit more about why we are doing underwater communications. Uh, probably the area is new to most of you. So I'll give you a, a little bit of background about that. Uh, I'll talk a little bit. So we have done, we're doing a software uh, using new radio. So I'll review the eye level design with you. We, are, we also have a paper and the, uh, there are more coding details in the paper. I had a paper also last week, uh, not last week, but last year in the previous GNU radio conference. And if you really want to understand everything, you have to look at the two papers. And I'll talk also a little bit about the performance of it. So there are many reasons why you uh, would be interested to do underwater communications. So monitoring and surveillance of coastal waters is one of them. Uh, submarine activity sensors, uh, autonomous undersea vehicles, drones, underwater ro drones, underwater, underwater robots also. And uh, airplane uh, locator, locator beacons. So I'm not too much into that. Uh, because uh, for uh, airplane locator beacons, they, uh, they have the constraints uh, of being compact. And they use a high frequency, 33 kilohertz. And their range is rather short. So an airplane uh, uh, locator beacon underwater has a range of just a little bit more than one kilometer. So we are trying to do much more than that. So I'm much more in the... Uh, on the first two things, and also um, the, the autonom uh, autonomous undersea vehicles, underwater robots. An important aspect of our research is mobility. 
So I'll um, give you an example of, uh, so of, of, of typical hardware, of hardware that, can, uh, that, that has been designed for doing work like that. Um, honestly, uh, most of the, of, the, of the things that have been done so far are at the prototype level. So you cannot buy hardware for doing that uh, at Walmart or Costco. We are not at that stage yet. And this is, uh, this is a, a one prototype that has been built and tested. So um, I'm going, it's representative, but there are, many other th there are many others that have been designed. But it's representative of what has been done so far. So this structure uh, is not small. It's actually uh, that big. It's taller than, than, than me and it cannot be manipulated by one person. Uh, I concentrate on the communication challenge, but there are many challenges in building something like that. It's a multidisciplinary problem. Uh, first of all, electronics and water don't mix very well, so it has to be waterproof. Another problem is power. So, uh, a lot of the weight in this is due to the battery. And the batteries right now, they don't last very long. And that's a big issue, because we need, we don't want to, uh, once, it's very costly to deploy, and it's also very costly and may, may be very difficult to, to recover. Because uh, uh, a node like that is pitched in the water, it reaches the seabed, and um, so uh, if, we are the, if we are in a, in a deep uh, area, it might, it might be very hard to recover. So I'll show you how, it's de how it deploys. Uh, so this thing, there's a, there's a computer inside. There's a commercial modem inside that for two-way communications. And it's a surveillance node. So it will deploy an array of hydrophone. So an hydrophone is a microphone designed for, for uh, underwater operation. And this uh, feature, this, I, this array of hydrophone is important because underwater, the conditions of, uh, for communications, they, uh, they vary a, a lot according to the depth. Okay, so according to the depth you are, you won't get necessarily the same information. So I'm going to play that. It's, it's going to show you how it, how it works. So we have the uh, deployment of the hydrophones. Okay. And it's normally almost ready for operation. So something like that uh, is very uh, costly to deploy. Uh, it's very also, also very costly to build. Um, if you, it's actually, it's, it's a good area. If you're a graduate student and you're looking for a topic for research, it's a, it's a, it's a good area. Uh, for, for uh, research because it's, it's a rather virgin territory. And uh, if you want to play with that, so this is, uh, of course, uh, not accessible to everybody, but there are cheaper solutions. Like if you have limited resources, and it's the case for most of us, you can look at my paper of last year. And I give, um, I have a, a, I started small with a, a uh, I started with a diver recall system. It's not very expensive and you can, you can experiment on the water communications with that. And I use hydrophones also uh, that are used by biologists to collect uh, sound from underwater. Okay, now a little bit of, of background about underwater communications. Um, so for, first of all, for underwater communications, we don't use electromagnetic waves. Okay? Because electromagnetic waves, they don't propagate in water. They don't go very far. We use sound. 
we use acoustic waves. It's a different phenomenon. It's a, it's a mechanical phenomenon. Now, this, the propagation speed compared to electromagnetic, electromagnetic waves is very slow, 1, 000, around 1,500 meters per second. So it means that with distance, delays uh, are very long. So we, count, we don't count delays in milliseconds. We count delays in seconds and maybe in minutes also. And there are several uh, uh, problems that have been documented. And I will focus on three main things that are important for long range communication. Attenuation, noise, and uh, in case of mobility, the Doppler effect. So we have a Doppler effect uh, when uh, mobility is involved. Okay, to give you an idea of the magnitude of attenuation on the water. So my, uh, attenuation depends on frequency. And there are mathematical models for that that we can use as, as a reference. And uh, here, for a, a, a couple of, of, so to achieve long range communications, we have to go low frequencies. So remember when I talk about airplane beacons, they uh, transmit at 33 kilohertz acoustic waves. It's short range. Okay? There are advantages. The main advantage is the small, they can work with small speakers. So when you lower the frequency, you can do longer distance, but the speakers for underwater uh, operation, they are like speakers for sound systems, they need to be bigger to produce the, uh, the, the corresponding sound waves. So here in this diagram, as a function of range in kilometer, in kilometer we have the transmission loss on a dB scale, okay? And you see, so this is 300 hertz, and we have 200, uh, 2,700 hertz, and you see it goes from at least 60 dB to 100 dB and, uh, and maybe more, 150 dB. Okay, but you see clearly that the lower the frequency, the better it is in terms of, of, of attenuation. So for us, the, 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 we try to operate at low frequency. Okay, and this is how we hope to do uh, long range communication. Now, one drawback of that, okay? So if you look at the gradient of the curves, it's very high. And that limits bandwidth. So there's a concept used in f for filters. It's called the half power bandwidth. So on the left side, I picture the frequency response of a, of, of a filter. Typically, you have a low cutoff frequency, a high cutoff frequency. And it's, this is where you have a drop in, uh, of 3 dB in gain, okay? So it's a concept that we use to estimate the available bandwidth at each frequency. So we start from a, a reference frequency, and when we have, uh, we, we, we go until we have a drop in 3 dB in strength, and this, this defines the bandwidth. And it's very, that's a problem with, uh, with low frequencies it's very, and distance. It varies with, with frequency and distance, but it becomes very narrow. Okay, so we, we, uh, we have very narrow bandwidth available. And it's, it's, uh, it's pictured here as a function of, of uh, again, the, I have a curve for 300 hertz in, in blue. And as a function of distance and, and kilometers, we have the uh, available bandwidth uh, if we, uh, according to the, the, the half power bandwidth concept. Now, um, regarding propagation, so we have attenuation, okay? But um, we, uh, we are optimistic that we can do long range. Why? Uh, you know whales, they can communicate 
from one hemisphere to the other. Okay, but they use very high power. The, uh, the, the sound waves produced by whales are very strong. And uh, sometimes, um, if the winning conditions are there, okay, so we, we, we think we can make it. Not always, but I picture an example here where the, the conditions are favorable for long-range propagation. I did a simulation with a tool called Bellhop. It's very popular in that field. Uh, the thing is, uh, the speed of sound underwater is not constant. Okay? It varies as a function of depth. And for this example, I have exaggerated a little bit the variation just to uh, make the example nice. So we have the speed of sound here as a function of depth. Okay, and you see at 500 meters, we have a, uh, a, uh, a small uh, drop okay, in, the speed of, in the speed of sound. And that creates a, a duct. Like if you, uh, your, uh, your, your amateur radio operators are familiar with the ducting effect that they use to make long distance contact on VHF, for instance. So we have something similar on the water. Uh, this creates a, a phenomenon of reflection. So the waves propagate with little interaction or, abs or very, very few interaction with the seabed and sea surface. So the wave, they, they can travel far. And on the right side, we have, in, uh, in the blue diagram, we have a picture of, uh, it pictures the propagation of, of the energy over 500 kilometers. Okay, so we hope, we are optimistic that eventually we can do distances like that, but we are not yet there. Okay, now about noise. So there are, uh, if you read peep, uh, papers about underwater communications, they will tell you uh, about various kinds of noise. Okay, you get noise from whales, uh, you get noise from shrimps, uh, way, uh, winds creates noise, but in, the, uh, in a mobile environment, the main source of noise, the main source of inter interference is the noise made by the, by the boats, okay? So we did the, a, a trial in last spring on the west coast near the uh, uh, Vancouver, around the Vancouver Island area. And we were on boats, so on, on military boats. I was not allowed to take pictures, but two weeks ago I was in Saint Malo in France and I saw a boat similar to the boat on which I was uh, to, uh, uh, for, for doing the test. And it was a boat similar like that, similar to this one. So they are very noisy. Okay, they, they send very, they, they generate very low pitch noise that, that, that are extremely more strong, extremely strong compared to the, the, the strengths of our signal. So that's a problem. Okay, and I'll, I'll show you a, a short recordings of what you hear on the water. So uh, on, one, on a boat like that we were sending, on another, uh, another boat like that we were receiving, we were able to do kilometers, uh, uh, contacts around several kilometers. Okay, but you'll see the, the amount of noise. So all the noise you hear, you will hear, is not our signal, is noise generated by the boats. And we were in an area where there were ferries also, so we get uh, uh, noise from other boats. So there is sound in it, I don't know if you can play it.
Yep. I'll, I'll uh, play it separate. Okay. I'm just wondering whether the mm -hmm. party. I'm not sure that. Okay, so um, uh, we don't have sound, so I'm going to explain it uh, visually. Okay, so you see here in the center. That's the trace of our signal. And these yellow traces, are, uh, uh, So, uh, if you're, Derek thinks the laptop will play the sound, so I could just hold the handheld mic over it if you want to give that a shot. Yeah, that's fine. So the, the tones that we hear, it's noise made by, by the, the engines of the boat. And it's maybe a million times stronger than the signal we are receiving. And it's very close. Uh, so uh, filtering is, very, is a very important aspect in this. So we cannot operate wide band. We have we operate very narrow band, just a few hertz. Okay, I think it's fine. So now we won't be able to stop it. Okay, uh, so I talked about noise. The main source of noise is, is due to the uh, maritime traffic. Uh, I'll talk now a little bit about uh, the Doppler effect. So this is the equation for the Doppler effect. It's the ratio of uh, the speed, so the, uh, the relative speed between the transmitter and the receiver over the uh, C, the propagation speed, times the frequency, okay? So we are transmitting at low frequency, uh, C is not big, propagation speed is small, uh, boats are not going that fast. So we don't get very big numbers for the Doppler shift. But because of the narrow bandwidth, okay, so the Doppler shift, even if it's a few hertz, it has an effect on a signal, it, has a, it is important. So relative to the bandwidth, the Doppler shift is important, okay? But few hertz, if you are in the megahertz uh, range, it's not significant. But in our range, it is significant. Okay, so um, one of the things we do we, um, in, for this work, we, we try to deal with Doppler shift. But Doppler shift, we are transmitting narrow bandwidth, so it's, it means we transmit low speed. So we, it takes about two seconds to send one bit. So if you send a frame not too big, 
it, uh, our, it takes a long time. So we, it takes 111 seconds to send one frame. So with the Doppler effect, the problem is the frequency does shift significantly during the transmission of a frame. So we have to track that. Uh, there are, we found that there are three types of Doppler shifts in our case. So the Doppler shift can be constant. So it's easy to deal with that. We find where the, the signal is and we lock on that signal from the, for the duration of the frame. We can also have a Doppler shift that is variable. So it can vary, it can vary linearly. This is also easy to deal with. So we, uh, we track uh, the, uh, the, the frequency and we, ha we had a little uh, frequency increment from one symbol to another. What is more challenging is when the Doppler shift has an arbitrary pattern, nonlinear. And I have ex an example here. So the signal is here, and suddenly it jumps there, and it returns progressively to this. Okay? So that's not easy to deal with in our context. So I'll talk a little bit about the, uh, the GNU radio solutions that we developed for that. So if you look at my uh, paper of last year, the work is based on a protocol called uh, WISPR, WSPR. Okay? So it has been developed by the amateur radio communication, uh, uh, amateur radio community for, for uh, weak signal communication very weak signal communications. We adapted it for underwater communications. Uh, in the adaptation, there are two main differences. The original WS uh, whisper is synchronous. So frames, the start of frames is uh, synchronized to the beginning of, of, uh, of two minutes interval. Okay, we do, cannot do that underwater because the propagation delays are too much, too high. Another thing uh, with the WSPR, whisper the, uh, the, the search for frames in a relatively large amount of bandwidth. It's still narrow, so it's like a, an audio channel, but we, we cannot deal with that because there's still too much noise for us. So we, uh, we work with very narrow channels, just a few hertz, just a few hertz of bandwidth. So one thing, I, what I did initially, I, I, I took the code from WSPR and I broke it into parts and I created new radio blocks for, for, for the code. So on the left, uh, if we start from the left side, there's a a block called sliding, sliding window to PDU. So what we do, we record two minutes of, of samples, okay? Then we slide nine, nine, nine seconds uh, in time. Okay, so it's a sliding window. And the, the search for signals is done offline. Okay, it's not in, like a in normal wireless, you will find the uh, uh, a synchronization preamble, then you decode in real time, bit by bit. It doesn't work like that, okay? So we, uh, we record signal, we record uh, channel, channel data, and we search for frames. So really, it's a, it's, it's a search it's problem more than a demodulation problem. So in the next block, FDR, we uh, built a frequency domain representation of the channel data. And we look first for peaks, okay? For peaks of energy in the spectrum. And these peaks indicate candidate frequencies. So from these, frequen from these candidate frequencies, we, 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 uh, there's a very long synchronization pattern. So in every data bit, there is a synchronization bit. 
So we, uh, we generate sliced uh, frequency domain representation, and we look for energy at the position of the synchronization bits, okay? And in the last stage, sync and demodulate, we find exactly where the uh, frames are, we synchronize, and we, de we demodulate. So it's based on uh, four FSK, and we use non-coherent uh, demodulation. And the last block is for, uh, we use the Whisper format for packets, and uh, it's the uh, decoder for the packet. So these are four blocks. So why uh, importing that code into GNU Radio? Uh, the reason is because all the environment that GNU Radio provides, and uh, we have uh, our blocks are here connected with other blocks. So we, we use all the filters that GNU Radio provides. And uh, this is the, uh, an audio uh, decoder. And just here, so the audio source, it's the abstraction of the hydrophone. Okay, in previous GNU radio conferences, I saw papers um, addressing uh, underwater communications. And uh, they were using uh, USRP radios with the HF daughter board, okay? Because the HF daughter board can go from DC to uh, 50 megahertz, something like that. Okay, so the audio spectrum is in that range. So that's a possibility. Uh, a much simpler solution is, is, a, is a good quality sound card. Okay, that's what we are using a good quality sound card. And they have XLR connectors and hydrophones. They are hydrophones with XLR connectors that can, can plug in the, uh, in the sound cards directly. So you don't necessarily need very sophisticated hardware for doing that. So this is an audio decoder. Uh, I won't show you the, uh, the, the graph for the uh, audio transmitter. It's simpler than that. In fact, the complexity is in the decoder, is in the, in the receiver. Uh, the transmitter is relatively simple. And uh, for transmission, they are very, you can find on, on YouTube uh, designs that are very simple and easy to achieve, but they will be short range. Okay, so with, with diver recall systems, uh, some of them, you can, you can plug the output of a computer to them and you can play sound on the water at relatively low cost with them. Okay, I'll stop here. Um, we have, uh, we will have a paper in the proceedings of the new radio conference, of this conference, that the proceeding will be published uh, Eventually, I think. Tomorrow. Tomorrow. Oh, that was really loud. Sorry. Okay. Um, I encourage you also to look at my paper of last year. And all the code is available on the GitHub uh, webpage. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you very much. Okay. Do we have any yes already questions? Marcus, can you run over there? I think there's one on the far side. What power were you transmitting? Is there a limit on the power underwater due to like cavitation or some nonlinear effect? So when we, uh, in la last spring, okay, uh, we, uh, we, we, the power was 140 dB, which is quite high. It's in reference uh, Micropascal. Yeah, it's the, 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 the strength of the sound, uh, of the sound wave. So I guess in, in watts, uh, it would translate maybe to uh, 100 watts. To... 
maybe more, a bit more than that. So the follow-up was, I think, follows that question. How careful you have to be with the marine animals and, you know, as much as it's uh, using a cheap uh, uh, infrastructure to do the experiments, how easy or hard it is to get approvals to do these experiments. Thank you. Okay. It's a question I always get. Okay. So for approval, uh, you don't have, uh, there are no regulations right now regarding underwater communications, like this, this, the audio spectrum underwater is not regulated. It's not like the, the uh, electromagnetic spectrum, okay? Um, that being said, we, our signals overlap with uh, the, uh, the, the bandwidth used by uh, sea mammals, okay? So, there are no studies, so I cannot tell uh, if we, uh, we, we, we are creating any problems uh, with respect to sea life. I cannot tell that. But uh, my intuition is that if we compare the strength of our signal with the strength of, of noise made by maritime traffic, so we are much lower than that, much narrow, narrower in terms of bandwidth, much weaker. So we might have an impact. I cannot guarantee we don't have, but I, my intuition is at this time is that it will be minimal. All right, I think just two more. Oh, okay, you and then uh, over here. Interesting domain. Interesting uh, domain. I'm wondering if you've done any work with uh, dual channel protocols for a low baud rate such as Bell 202. Uh, dual channels, I, I, uh, I haven't tried dual channels, but I think it's something possible. Like it's, it's the way multiple channels, it's the way to go to increase the, uh, the data rates. Because right now uh, with the approach uh, I described today, it's only, effectively it's only half a bit per second. So we, uh, we have to go multiple channels to uh, increase the bandwidth. And your other question was? No, uh, we have one over here. This will be the last question. Okay. Uh, yes, you uh, talked about the uh, engine noise being the predominant interferer there. Uh, I couldn't see the diagram you had on the decoder, but did you consider any type of equalization or something that could cancel that out and perhaps give you uh, a higher data rate if, as opposed to just filtering out the uh, running a really narrow bandwidth yeah. there? I haven't done any equalization work. But there are people before me who tried that, who, uh, who tried some, it's something we can try in the future, but I haven't done any work in that direction so far. Okay, and I guess I don't know much about acoustics, but is there, on the transmit side, is there any way that you can get an antenna gain effect or anything like that in underwater communications, where you get some directivity on your Yes, transmit we can signal? get some directivity. In fact, uh, any uh, uh, underwater speaker or vibrator is directional in some way. Like they are, it's like, like it, the perfect omnidirectional antenna that doesn't exist. It's the same thing underwater. They all have patterns. Okay, that's all we have time for. Let's thank our speaker. <laughs>